spastic dysarthria, the word spastic is somewhat related to spasm. So when you say spastic, you need to think increased tone. The muscles for speech have increased tone both at rest and during movement. Now spastic dysarthria is only caused by bilateral upper motor neuron impairment. Why bilateral? So the lower motor neurons of cranial nerves are almost exclusively bilaterally innervated. I have another video that explains this in detail. Please check it out because I'm not going to go into as much detail here, but it explains the, the reasons for spasticity and the differences between cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. But in a nutshell, if you have damage just along one side, that won't affect the lower motor neuron because the other side will take over because you can see they branch out and decussate to the other side, but they also innervate the ipsilateral side. So damage to one side won't have long-term impact on the lower motor neuron. And that's in contrast to spinal nerves where, where they're not bilaterally innervated. So a single stroke high up near the cortex even means that you get spasticity in the upper limb, lower limb, etc. And why does it have to be upper motor neuron? Obviously, the lower motor neurons directly innervate the muscle and they tell it what to do. The upper motor neurons, which consists of the pyramidal and the extrapyramidal neurons, and again, see my other video for an explanation, one of the things they provide is an inhibitory effect of the stretch reflex. So there are spindles within the muscles. The spindles give us information about proprioception, so they tell us exactly what our muscles are doing and how extended they are, and that's how we can tell what our body's doing with our eyes closed. But in addition to communicating with the brain, they also have a reflex where they react to any changes in length by contracting. And that allows you to maintain the same posture or the same position without brain involvement. Now the upper motor neurons, their job is to inhibit that at times. So to tell them to calm down and to allow the muscle to stretch at certain times. So without the upper motor neurons giving them that signal to relax, the stretch reflex overreacts and causes high tone. One way to think of it is if you can drive a, a manual car, the stretch reflex wants to increase tone and the clutch is the upper motor neurons telling it to relax. So as soon as the clutch no longer works, the foot is down and the resting tone goes up. The muscles are tight and too tight. Now what can cause this? Because it has to be bilateral, you can't get it from a single stroke unless the stroke is right down in kind of the pons medulla brainstem area where it has the opportunity to damage uh, the upper motor neurons bilaterally. But most strokes are further up in the cerebrum and don't damage both sides. Nonetheless, a brainstem stroke can cause spastic dysarthria. Another cause would be multiple strokes. So a single stroke, you'll get compensation, but then if you have another stroke a year later, then all of a sudden you've got bilateral damage. And that doesn't mean any two strokes will do it, but if the both strokes affect the upper motor neurons, then yes, you can get spastic dysarthria. Um, other causes might be traumatic brain injury because the brain has very diffuse damage. You get sort of bouncing in the skull and shearing of the brain and kind of lots of damage throughout the brain. That can that can affect the upper motor neurons on both sides and therefore cause spastic dysarthria. Cerebral palsy is another cause um, and also progressive diseases such as progressive supranuclear palsy or motor neuron disease, ALS, um, and potentially tumors and things like that. So basically anything that can damage the upper motor neurons bilaterally has potential to cause spastic dysarthria. So what does it sound like with the increased tone of the articulators and the muscles of speech production? So tight tongue, um, tight jaw and lips. Um, perceptually, it sounds, it's slow. And it's slow because it's tight. And also because it's tight, it's very imprecise, as in the muscles aren't capable of doing really finely controlled movements. Because they've already got increased tone and then you're asking them to make small, fine adjustments. So think about if you're doing weights and rehanging a bar when your arms are fully extended and they're struggling to lift it and then you're wanting them to move gently over to a hook without squashing your own hands, that can be quite difficult. 
Or another example is when you are holding up a heavy bag of groceries or something and trying to put the key into the lock, your muscles are already in use, already tensed. So you can still make major movements, but you're not good at really finely controlled movements. And if you think about the very fine movements required to produce normal speech, even the slightest deviation can cause dysarthria that other people will notice. Uh, which components are affected? Not really respiration, but phonation, and that's probably possibly the biggest giveaway for spastic dysarthria. It sounds um, strained or strangled, and it's very slow to change pitch because it's tight. The laryngeal muscles are tight. They can't jump up and down around like with normal prosody. As for articulation, again, very slow, very effortful. And there's the sense that they're kind of pushing through to actually produce the phonemes. And that's due to the, the spasticity in the muscles. And because they're slow and effortful, they're very imprecise as well. As we discussed, getting a key into a lock or producing a gap for an S, if the muscles are tight, it's hard to do those movements. You'll also get kind of prolonged phonemes, like increased duration of phonemes and between transitions because you can't just flick your tongue up, make it to and then turn around and move it back. It doesn't want to change direction very quickly. Resonance, you do get some hypernasality, but it's not pronounced like it is in flaccid dysarthria, so it's not um, necessarily a distinctive feature. Phonation, because it's so slow and doesn't like to change very quickly, that impacts prosody. And two additional things that I always use to help me differentially diagnose, if I'm thinking spastic dysarthria, things that you might see are a hyperactive gag reflex. So of course not everyone has a gag reflex and if it's not there that doesn't necessarily mean it's not spastic dysarthria. But if it's really hyperactive as in you know you, you put a tongue depressor only halfway back on their tongue and they start gagging then that suggests spastic dysarthria. Because it's not just the stretch reflex that overreacts it's the gag reflex as well. And the other one is increased emotional lability. Uh, often doctors call it pseudobulbar affect. And this is usually asking the question, do you find you are laughing and crying more than you would expect or at unexpected moments? Um, because there's damage to inhibition areas in the brain that usually inhibit emotional responses, such as laughing and crying, and they're closely located with a lot of the upper motor neuron tracts. So damage to them results in them crying maybe inappropriately when they're not even upset, or perhaps crying out of proportion to the incident. So I had one patient who cried kind of tears of joy at the Olympic opening ceremony and he acknowledged that actually it's not that big a deal you know it's a nice gesture or the country's coming together but it didn't it didn't demand that sort of response and yet he couldn't suppress it. So these two features help you to um, confirm spasticity and upper motor neuron damage but they may not necessarily be present. Let's have a look at some different examples of spastic dysarthria. Okay so this first video is an oromotor exam of somebody all the way out. Keep them back and forth. Poking their tongue out, you can see there's some tension in there already. It's kind of curled upwards. Moving very slowly. Okay. Put it back in and say la 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 la. La 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 la. So that was very slow. And you can hear what's happening with his voice. That's strained phonation. Say pa pa pa. Pa pa pa. I would actually be asking him to do it as fast as he can. I think it'd be a safe bet that he can't go a lot faster than that because all his muscles are really tight. Say ka ka ka. Ka ka ka. Say ka. Ka. Catch. Catch. Okay. Do you notice, although he's really slow, it doesn't sound weak. It doesn't sound like he's under articulating. He is producing a good strong k for ka and the p and the la but they're just really slow because by the time he moves his articulators there, the soft part of the tongue builds up pressure, releases, moves away. That's taking him so much longer. We'll just jump back and listen to those again. Say pa pa pa. Pa pa pa. And say ka ka ka. Ka ka ka. Say ka. Ka. Catch. Catch. Okay. So the crisp just articulations are just slow. With your jaw. I'm just gonna tap you. Here he's looking for a jaw just jerk relax. reflex. So there you go. It's a reflex that shouldn't be present. Okay. Um, 
you have a positive charger. Look that up elsewhere, I'm not going to go through it here, but... Okay. Um, but when reflexes are stronger than they should be, that also indicates likely spastic dysarthria. So it's not just the stretch reflex, remember it's gag reflex, jaw reflex, etc. I'm going to have you stick out your tongue, and I want you to say, ah. Oh. Ah. Oh. Say, ah oh, again. Ah. Oh. Okay, let's see if we can... See the tongue's not actually central, it's deviating to one side. My guess is this man has cerebral palsy and it's probably not affecting both hemispheres equally. But nonetheless, it does look like the spasticity on both sides. Well, of course, yeah, we can just help you out. <sighs> Say, ah, oh. <sighs> Say, ah, again. Ah. <sighs> okay, now I'm just going to open your mouth wide. And do you feel that? Okay, oh, that's yucky, okay. So he's just tested the gag reflex without consent, which is not... Well, possibly he did have consent prior to the video, but it's definitely present. It didn't seem particularly strong. In some patients, you can only get sort of halfway down their tongue before they gag. It's either present or hyperactive. I couldn't quite say how far back he got. All right. Kind of easy to gag, isn't it? Yeah. It's... So he's saying it's easy to gag, which suggests it was a bit hyperactive, oversensitive. Okay, next one's some actual speech with the same gentleman. I'm going to show you this picture. Can you tell me what's happening in that picture? It's a sled thing. Okay, can you make up a story about it? It's a sled. It looks like he's also got spasticity of his upper limbs there. Um, possibly, I mean, this is obviously not my area, but it just looks like a bit of extra tone. Okay, anything else going on? He's sliding down snow. Okay. So what do you notice about his speech there? Again, it is relatively accurate but slow. It sounds a little bit effortful. Phonation is not as strained as you can get, but it's if, if you were to reproduce that yourself, that uh, you're actually having to increase the adduction of your vocal folds, even though it is breathy, like there's clearly some, some air coming through that's not being vibrated. Um, nonetheless, I would this would make me think more spastic than flaccid. Um, can you read to me what... Can you read to me this paragraph? My wife died for the front of our yard one day when the newspaper boy came down uh, the street on his bicycle. Okay. So what's happening in this story? The paper was coming down the street. And how is So the paper boy is coming down the street. That took him a long time to say that. Is he coming down the street? On his bicycle. And who's watching him? No one. Okay. Nobody's seeing him at this time? Um, I'm dad's wife. Very good. What is this? A tie. What's this? A ring. And what's this? A watch. What, what part of the watch is this right here? Time. Okay. Let's see. Hmm. What is this? Pen. And what do you do with it? Right. Okay. Can you say this? No ifs, ands, or buts. No ifs, ands, or buts. Good. The way he was talking to him makes me think that maybe he has, um, makes me think that he has an intellectual disability. So either he has, he's got 
a form of cerebral palsy which has affected his cognition. Um, or if this, there is something else going on, it's also affected his cognition because he didn't know what the face of the watch was. He just called it time. I'm ho hoping you can almost hear the tightness in both the muscles of phonation and also articulation and that they're affecting the prosody. So that increased tone is, is causing a strained sound and a really slow speech. All right, next one is a Spanish news story about uh, someone with cerebral palsy. Um, it's kind of helpful that if you don't speak Spanish, that you can listen to the features of their speech without being distracted by the semantics or the content of what they're saying. Pergunta aqui para o Johnny. Johnny, é, o que é que você gosta de... First up, you can literally see the um, spasticity of the uh, the trunk and the neck there. So that's already a, a clue. And you can see his jaw seems to be quite flexed and possibly his facial muscles as well. So you can see the increased tone before he even speaks. Fazer lá em Almina Afonso, John. Eu vou andar a ladeira. Aí é um gogu, um guá. And then you can see it in his hands there as well. Severely strained, strangled phonation. Articulation is quite unclear. Ele diz que na outra cadeira não consegue andar, que está as pernas doídas de empurrar. But in this case, the phonation is more striking than the articulation. Vai empurrar sozinho? É. Aí eu dia eu fico doido. Fica todo doido no outro dia. Okay, another example. The next two are audio only. And they were originally made on records, I believe, which were then transferred to cassette, which have then been digitized. So they are quite damaged, quite poor quality, like they're basically potato quality. But if you can kind of ignore that and just listen to what features you can, I still think they're quite useful despite their really, really bad quality. Here is a young woman of 22 with spastic dysarthria due to congenital cerebral agenesis. So called cerebral pulse. She was a spastic child and she now has inadequate control of her right hand. I should point out that this recording was made in like 1961. So saying things like she was a spastic child and she has inadequate control are obviously a little bit uh, less accepted nowadays, but just if you can look past that because it's nearly, um, what, 60 years ago? She can walk about a mile with a slow, awkward gait. What is your trouble? And how old are you now? Twenty-two. Now, uh, will you count from one to ten? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so you can hear there is some hyperreduction of her vocal folds in her voice, but probably what stands out more is her articulation. So her tongue is clearly. Um, kind of you can hear it's bunched up and tight so it's not able to make really precise little movements and I would say also her facial muscles because her F's and V's are very inaccurate. Right. And what's your address? Can you say Sister Susie's um, songs for soldier? Sometimes it helps to think, what do I have to do to imitate that? And to imitate that, you have to kind of bunch up your tongue, tighten your lips, tighten your vocal folds a bit. Now say, the baby hippopotamus. The baby hippopotamus. Met many riders on the road. Many riders at the Royal Horticultural Show. So that's another example. And the next example, um, all the ones we've heard so far have been cerebral palsy. This is a man with um, severe hypoxic injury after surgery. I believe he had a cardiac arrest after a surgery and was deprived of oxygen for something like two or three minutes. And that caused very severe physical and cognitive impairment and damage throughout the brain. So that's one of the examples we were talking about where you have damage on both sides of the brain, but diffusely rather than a particular spot as in a stroke. Listen to how slow it is, how extremely tight it sounds, and just how difficult it is to understand. Can you tell me what your address is? Uh, the of the and the now, I've got it down at 
say he's actually having trouble turning his voice on and off to make voiceless sounds it seems like the only way that he stops voicing is if he uses a plosive consonant So this last example is um, a milder dysarthria. This man um, um, has progressive supranuclear palsy or PSP. PSP typically produces hypokinetic, so similar to Parkinson's, hypokinetic dysarthria or spastic or occasionally some ataxic elements. In this case you can hear that there's not a lot of spasticity in his phonation and his prosody is reasonable as a result but if you listen to his articulation and the rate that's where you can hear the spasticity. It's often misdiagnosed as Parkinson's without a cure anyway. I'm next door to the captain. Humphreys, Ms. Cheryl. My body um, is packing up. I used to um, play squash once a week or twice a week. I can't do it anymore. And I joined the golf club. So just slow articulation because the muscles are already slightly spastic, slightly increased tone, so they don't want to, they're resistant to fast movements because they're already tight. Which I can't do anymore, so I can't stand still. A long walk for me is 20 or 30 yards. I used to be able to go five miles on the golf course. I left the mail a year ago on October the 9th after 30 years. I kept on falling backwards and um, it um, manifests itself that way. It can be quite difficult when dysarthria is a mild like this because you know, you're not getting strong patterns of any particular thing, but given that it's PSP, that helps me narrow it down to hypokinetic or spastic or maybe a little bit of ataxic. And those features do sound like the early symptoms of spastic dysarthria rather than the rushes and the under, under articulation that you would hear in hypokinetic. So hopefully those examples give you a feel for spastic dysarthria. What are the shortcuts? Well, the overriding impression is one of increased tone or tension in the muscles. If speech is effortful, so whether that plays out in strained phonation or effortful articulation or both, that's the feature you should be listening out for. And use these additional features to help you differentially diagnose. Not always present. If one or both of them is present, that's helpful as a confirmatory symptom. Well, that's all from me. A long video this one, but hopefully gives you an impression of spastic dysarthria. Check out my other videos for more tutorials and information.